On February 25th of 2022, many individuals would dip their toes into From Software's nexus of creation for the first time with Elden Ring. To be honest with you, it felt like all of us were in a stranglehold for quite a while until natural decline came as it does and people moved away from the game. We were left in the dark for a while regarding further updates to the title. Armored Core 6 was right around the corner, so that's pretty normal. However, as always, Miyazaki and his creative team did not leave us in that dark state for too long. And in 2024, we are now graced with the epic that is Shadows of the Erd Tree. Today on Dynamic Entry, I'd like to talk a little bit about this new DLC, what it's added, what people are saying about it, and my own personal experiences. Spoiler alert, front out, I'm not really going to go into too much detail about the story, the lore, or anything like that. But I will be mentioning things, locations, and items fairly freely if I feel like it. So this is your warning now. If you don't want to hear anything about the DLC, if you don't want to hear anything about what goes on in there, probably click off the video now. And thanks for coming anyway. For anyone else who decided to stick by, we got a lot to talk about, so let's get started. As my friends and I make our own way through the Land of Shadows, I have to admit, I am continuously surprised by the scale of the DLC. Between the catacombs and jails, the sheer scale of the height in many of the places, and the depths that you go to. Everything in between has been fabulous, and I think that we were misled just a tiny bit on the topography. They told us we'd be dealing with Limgrave, not half the freaking map from the first game spread out into a newer area. It's just been an absolute delight. The biomes themselves have been a decent mix of previous enemies from the old game, as well as new enemies and variants in the DLC. So far, I haven't had too many issues as far as the density or placement of enemies, and I think that the areas that lack them, uh, whether they be stretches of lands in the gravesite plains, or even the long, yawning expanse of the Abyssal Forest, I think everything is taken care of very well. There's a lot of intention as to where certain things are, and when you even get into places like Mindra's Manse or the Shadow Keep, that, that density comes back to bite you, where you, you may have had these open expanses before, now you're in closed quarters and people are all over you, and it's just a little claustrophobic. I think it's great. Personally, no complaints as far as that's concerned. And you know me. I'm pretty good at complaining, so that's a good thing. As far as equipment is concerned, holy crap, we've, we're eating good. Like there's no, there's, I'm, I'm getting my phone for this one because I have statistics. Just to give it to you straight, right? We have a total of 103 new weapons, uh, 145 new protective pieces, uh, 54 new armor sets in total, 42 new spells in the game, 14 sorceries, and 28 incantations, 39 new talismans, 25 new ashes of war, 20 new spirit ash summons, uh, and 8 new weapon types, including the best weapon they've ever put in Elden Ring, hand-to-hand -hand combat and dry leaf arts. Just, oh, to run the ones in the land of shadows has been so good. It's just, mm, it's something I've missed. With all of these goodies, as well as the sheer scale of the DLC, I don't have a lot to bitch about at all. However, I would be remiss to not mention that there are some complaints and comments that I have read around the community, newcomers to the community, veterans alike, and anyone else regarding a few different things. Some folks are not happy with the difficulty scaling. Uh, other folks have some issues with the enemy placement themselves. It, specifically, in this case, we'd be talking about a certain Commander Gaius and a Golden Hippo, but we'll get into that in a second. Look, I'm just gonna come out and say it. I'm a pretty notorious From Software Glazer, so you have to understand there's going to be a thick degree of bias when I talk about something that they make. That being said, I actually don't have a lot of issues with some of the complaints raised. So in regarding Commander Gaius and the Golden Hippo, these two bosses were actually nerfed a little bit with their starting positions being changed from how they were originally set in their boss arena. Some folks are complaining that this undervalues the difficulty that was initially set by the developers, while others are much more thankful for the opportunity as it gives them a way to finally get into these aggressive boss fights without being completely trounced right as you go in. 
I'll be honest, by this point in the Shadow Keep, when I fought the Golden Hippo pre-patch, I wasn't having the same difficulty, but I'm running the Bloodhound step on my Dry Leaf Arts, so I kind of just moved out of the way. And really, that's just how I decided to solve the problem. There is no true right or wrong answer. You can even go in with negative values on your damage if you wanted. You could get it done if you got the timing and stuff down, but it all comes down to personal play. I can understand to a point that people have their opinions on the builds you use, the legitimacy of completing a run if you used Scarlet Rot, Poison, Frostbite, Bleed. Some people are even up in arms about the use of Revenant Ashes or the Mimic tier, which is one of the hugest. But my personal thing there is I just like all the other spirit summons. Like I mentioned, Swordmaster Yash, the little demi-human swordsman guy, he's amazing. And I just personally like to explore the other options in the game outside of just spawning a clone of myself. That being said, I don't think that the completion of a boss fight or parts of the game using these mechanics and things given to you by the developers undersells your accomplishments. I'm not the one to tell you how to get the oranges up the stairs. I just care that it happens. You know what I'm saying? The closest example I could think of when it comes to like boss nerfing and difficulty and that whole pride thing comes from Bloodborne. To be specific, within the first update or pre-update to Bloodborne, there were a lot of things that made it not the best experience. Loading times for ones were completely atrocious, and one of the early bosses, Father Gascoigne, served as a hard benchmark for many players. Now, I have the good luxury to say that after 15 deaths on night one, I was able to beat Father Gascoigne and advance further into Odin Chapel, but I know plenty of other people that were having a hard time with it and were relegated to either cheesing using the Hunter's Axe or doing summons. But to be completely honest with you, after Father Gascoigne was patched and some of his changes were implemented, it didn't really change enough to make it worth it. It's not like he just gives up attacks to you or he's easier to stun. It's still Father Gascoigne. He's still going to be all over you and he's still a really good benchmark entry boss when it comes to that area of Bloodborne. My point here is that while there were changes made intentionally by the devs to make the experience a bit easier, I don't think it fucking matters. Who cares about the pride and arguments behind these, these things with like the builds and what you're using and the div... Shut up. Just play the fucking game. It's a single player experience for the most part or a multiplayer experience that you can opt into because invasions are a whole other argument that I'm not hearing either. And who cares, man? Just enjoy it. The whole point is that you as the aspiring Elden Lord, helm the world in the direction that you would. And regarding the pause button argument, you know, now that I'm older and I have a lot less time than I'd like to dedicate to playing games, I kind of get it, you know? I, even when I get home after work, I don't always get to just sit down and do stuff. I still have other crap to do around the house, catching up with the family, stuff like that, you know? like. It, it's life. It's gonna happen. And if we're gonna be elitist about it, Sekiro had a fucking pause button. And everyone says that Sekiro is the hardest of the FromSoft games. Who was bitching about the Sekiro pause button? No one? Because you got a breather from that difficult ass game. I'm just saying, if the whole argument is, hmm, you make it easier that way, does it? Doesn't really change anything. You can pause button all you want, but if fucking Morgoth is still charging at you and throwing his stupid is it death bite i don't know what he uses in the second time you fight him if when he throws that debuff at you you pause it it's still going to be coming at you it's not going to really change that much it would only affect online play and in that case just make it like the map where it doesn't open when there's enemies around like well it's fine it's not that big of a deal again really that's more of a justification from my own stance when it comes to these modes of thinking but again i don't think that how you play the game or even wanting to have a bit of a break while playing the game is a disservice at all. And the fact that some fans get so vehement when it comes to this standpoint and just foam at the mouth to fight with other people online, it's goofy. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? Furthermore, the Shadows of the Earth Tree DLC gives you such freedom when it comes to designing your build and putting things together the way that you want. Why wouldn't you want to just take advantage of all the systems? If I was to name any one thing that I thought was weird about the DLC, but I've come around on, 
it would be the similarities in like the creation and use of characters, bosses, and NPCs in the DLC. One specific example I have is Rel Relena. Yeah, the Twin Moon. She's amazing. I think she's great. Cool swordsman. I love the fucking Pontiff Sullivan sword of night and flame thing. Her swords are great. Her armor is great. But anybody who's played Dark Souls 3 would know that her boss fight, at least in its like theming and the whole magic and fire thing, does kind of harken back to the Dancer of the Boreal Valley and Pontiff Sullivan in combination. But I don't think that detracts from the experience. Actually, what I started to think after noticing that, and then a few other similarities, Winter Lanterns in the Abyssal Woods, for instance, right? It just made me think of parts of the experience from like Bloodborne, the Ring City DLC of the Dark Souls games, and even a little bit Sekiro, you know? It, it was then that I figured out what it really was. So earlier in the beginning of the video, I mentioned that this Elden Ring was the first outing for a lot of people when it came to the FromSoft games. What hit me was that this is the first time they'd come into a lot of these reference points. I mean, Kai becoming one of the biggest Elden Ring fans after everything was not on my bingo card, but I happily invite him to join us here in the community because he's proven it and he got down the spirit of it too, which was, you get hurt, shit's hard, but you get back up, you try again, you persevere, and eventually you overcome the challenge in front of you. Nice little allegory for life and all that, and I think it's pretty cool. Overall, the Shadows of the Earth Tree DLC has been a delightful jaunt for me, and I get that some people are having trouble with it. Go get your Shadow Tree fragments. I went and I grabbed 10 fragments as soon as I could. I beat Relena and the Divine Beast, the Lion Dancer, with like four, and I regret it because it was fucking stupid. I could have made it easier on myself if I wouldn't have been such a proud asshole. So take a note from me, let go of that stuff, and just have fun, you know? A little jolly cooperation with your friends, or maybe you put your summon sign down and help somebody across the world with a boss fight, who knows? I just think that we should take the time to enjoy things for what they are, and fully, instead of nitpicking on such a great little masterpiece that is this DLC. And at 40 bucks too, I mean, fucking A. Like you can't even get a full game with double that money sometimes when you pay 70 and $80 for a new game. It's insane. It's a delight. And anyone who would detract from that situation and experience both for themselves and other players, whether it be in how they play the game or how they project their own emotions online, I don't know. I think it's crazy. Shadows of the Earth Ur Tree deserves all the tens it gets. It's amazing. You should try it. You should be willing to open up to the experience because I, I guarantee you, if you give it a chance, you're going to have so much fun, man. But those are my thoughts on Shadows of the Earth Tree, the Elden Ring DLC, and how I feel about it. But what do you think? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Would you rate it a 10 as well? Do you think it's too difficult? Do you think it's too easy? I'm kind of middle of the road. I actually don't think it's that hard once you kind of get everything in. It doesn't matter. Let me know down below how you feel about it. And as always, thanks for stopping by for another video. Love to have these chats with you, oh, internet friends. And thank you for 400, by the way. That was a big milestone and we appreciate everybody who participated in that. Here's to many more videos and many more followers down the road. Peace.